Uh, we're going to the last part of our uh, Congress uh, summit, and this is the most interesting one. First of all, because the, the moderator of the next group, uh, panel group, is uh, Pandelis Labru, a person who really is a good business consultant, and he will um, moderate a discussion in order for us to draw all conclusions from what we have heard all day long. Padeli, are you here with us today? Yes, yeah, yes. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words. And you are, no, 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 you have the task, you have the <laughs> obligation, not only to conduct the discussion, but also to draw the conclusion so you don't do my job. You do my job, so I don't have to do anything after you finish. Okay? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you, Chris and uh, Konstantinos Suzunis for the invitation uh, to undertake the coordination of this, uh, I think, uh, interesting and useful panel with a critical theme, how the ESG factors will be incorporated in the corporate strategy, in the corporate mentality. That's all we issue, need to know. Uh, an issue that we hope to add competitiveness to the companies and this specific issue we hope that will add will contribute to the turnaround of the Greek economy with an easier and more uh, faster way. I think that uh, during the course of, the, uh, of this panel we will discuss how the DNA of the company will incorporate in a natural way the ESG provisions, how the traditional key performance indicator of financial return of the company should be transformed in order to be combined with risk management factors and with time of business life, how, let's say in other words, the new key performance indicator of the company and the economy in a general will be converted and to be the, the corporate return adjusted with risk factor for a certain period of time. What is the impact of that adoption of that transformation of the incorporation of VAG factors into the company's life? And how the corporate governance and TSG provisions will help, help in that direction? Uh, also, I would like to congratulate all the members of the, of the organization team for their endeavors to provide professional, high-level services aligned with the requirements of the current situation. Uh, and I think that uh, soon we'll be uh, together in, an, in other conditions. But I think that uh, the technology will help to get all the benefits of this uh, get-together conference call by using the technology. Uh, I am Pandelis Lambro. I am co-founder and uh, CEO of BNI, Products and Investment, and a business management uh, consulting company. Uh, we will start the panel two by Mr. Thibaut Barsa. Uh, Thibaut is vice president Head of Southern European Research from International Shareholder Services. Thibault will participate with voice only. Uh, we will uh, make a short presentation and we will discuss with Thibault uh, some, I think, interesting uh, uh, questions and uh, how all these things uh, will uh, apply in the Greek environment. And after that, we will continue with uh, Lia Vigileo, Mrs. Lia Vigileo and Mrs. Maria Larso Ortino, uh, that will uh, participate with voice and video. Uh, hi, Mr. Thibault. Uh, let's say I'll pass the floor to my friend in order to say a few words about yourself, your company, and uh, make an initial uh, statement for the concept of that panel. Um, so, as uh, Patrice mentioned, so I'm head of uh, Southern European Research within Institutional Shared Services, also, know, also known as ISS, 
I'm also supervising the um, policy developments at European level. So um, ISS is operating in the same sector as uh, Glass Lewis, so I'm going to be a bit redundant with, with Patrick earlier before. Um, so ISS is mostly known for being a proxy advisor, which means that we provide um, vote recommendations to, to investors, um, but not, not only that, we also help them to exercise their voting rights in all regards um, coming from the, the ballot to the execution of votes at general meetings and vote reporting as well. Um, our, we provide these services to institutional investors who are minorities um, in the investing companies. And uh, something I would like to highlight is that um, those investors are long. Um, um, we do not advise uh, investors that, that are shorting uh, stocks, for instance. Uh, we have offices all across the globe. Uh, in Europe, we have uh, our main offices are in Stockholm, Berlin, London, Paris, and Brussels. Our uh, research staff is, um, is about 50 to 60 people in Europe. <coughs> and um, we cover, well, let's say, more than 40,000 meetings a year, every year. Um, so, I, I, I started my introduction by saying that we are mostly a uh, proxy advisor, but um, for the time we have been more, much more than this actually, um, because of, of um, investor demand towards uh, ENS uh, matters. Um, the G has been around for, for many years now, um, but the ENS uh, has gained momentum um, in the last, I would say, 10 years, but um, mainly in the last five years, and especially since the, the Paris Accords uh, in 2015. And so we have, uh, ISS has developed a um, series of, of products and services uh, so that uh, investors can assess uh, corporate behavior in terms of, of ENS and not only G. Um, um, so uh, the, the, the way, I mean, the, the thing that maybe I wanted to, to address today is the, how we, we consider and use non-financial information as a proxy advisor. Um, yes, this is uh, we, the main uh, issue that uh, we would like to, to understand how your company uses all this uh, non-financial information as a proxy advisor, Thibault. Yes, indeed. Well, uh, the answer is in many different ways. Um, there is the, the governance thing. Um, we, need to, we need to distinguish between uh, what is uh, the exercise of rights from shareholders, so mainly voting rights, and so these are, this is related to the competence of the general meeting. Um, at the moment, um, the general meeting's the general meeting competencies are mainly related to the G, uh, to the G aspect. Uh, so when it comes to direct elections, uh, executive compensation, um, articles of association amendments, um, share capital increase, M&A transaction, and so on and so forth. All the ENS um, is, is a very different matter. And on this, uh, the, what we've noticed from, from the investor community is a real demand for, for ratings and for, for screening tools. What I think what uh, what corporation needs to understand, and I think um, Michael earlier on alluded to that uh, when he said that there are some companies that are let's say on a blacklist. Um, ESG has to be seen as as a potential risk for investors. Um, I'm not going to say anything surprising here, but um, investors are, are perhaps the, the people who are the most risk risk adverse on the earth, and so um, they want to make sure that. Um, the investments are, if not risk-free, at least um, they, they are exposed in the less to potential risks. Um, while financial has been um, the easiest way to assess risk um, for decades or even centuries, um, I think there is a growing uh, awareness from both, well, both sides, so companies and, and investors, but ESG can pose uh, potential risks in terms of uh, financial returns. In another presentation, um, I can't, can't remember exactly what I was saying, but 
a non-financial uh, risk now can can turn into a, a financial risk in the future. Uh, I couldn't agree more than with this, with this statement. So, <coughs> sorry, um, we we have set. Um, I mean, we, we have we have implemented uh, services, and in terms of CNS, um, the ratings are the most popular, so to speak. And the, the issue here, and I think it was also mentioned in another presentation, is that the, the standards um, are, are multiple and very uh, very diverse. Um, there are many initiatives across the globe uh, on on how to report and how to disclose uh, ENS practices from companies, and there there is a lack of uh, uniformization of this of this standard. Um, I think companies like ISS. But not only the companies are access, I think that the efforts we, we, we are making here is try to compile and to collect uh, the data available and to let's say standardize all the data to make sure that I mean to make sure that the, the investors have a tool <coughs> that enables them to, to assess in a in, in a very standardized way uh, all, all what is all that is done by, by companies and, and corporations across the globe. Yes, yes, very, very interesting. Uh, now let's make a bridge with the Greek companies, Greek reality. What about ESG provisions and practices and the connection with the Greek market? Um, well, this, this needs to be understood uh, within, within the legal framework. Um, there are some global initiatives and regional initiatives. Uh, the EU is very active in this regard. Um, and then on the, more, on the more granular level, so the domestic level, um, the um, evolution of the law in Greece has been uh, dramatic uh, in the last 10 to 20 years uh, with the recent uh, implementation of the uh, Shareholder Rights Directive too, especially. Um, I think... Um, the, the, the practices, what, what, I mean, what we've experienced so far, um, is hopefully being something belonging to the past. Um, earlier on, the, the minister, the minister uh, mentioned the, the example of folly folly. Uh, this is something that, yeah. of course, investors do, do not like and want to, 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 to get rid of, so to speak. Um, the, the, the legal framework, uh, as I think. And, but there's always always room for improvement. But the legal framework has um, provided and will provide a much more robust, um, let's say, um, tool for companies to adhere to higher standards in terms of covenants, especially. And on the ENS, that would be on the it's more longer longer goal, longer term goal. Um, yes. What what what's also important, and this is something we also experienced as a proxy advisor, is the matter of disclosure. Uh, we felt that in many regards, um, disclosure in Greece has been, um, let's say, lagging behind um, EU standards um, in terms of timely, or timing, sorry, and in terms of content. Uh, what has been striking this year, uh, as you may all know, that uh, companies have to submit the remuneration reports for the first, first, first time this year. And it was striking how um, companies, some companies, um, take this exercise as really an effort to um, to communicate their, their practices in the in a, in a most uh, understandable way, uh, while others are, are just, I mean, they provide and show their, their report, but the, what the impression they give is that it, they do that for compliance purposes. Um, again, the not disclosing a piece of information is, um, let's say, it can be seen as something dodgy. Um, so investors are really demanding uh, clear information, and and in terms of governance, um, the, the, the key, I guess, the key message here is is that. Um, the investors are, are really focusing on, on ESG nowadays, 
um, because of all um, scandals that have happened in the past, not only in Greece but worldwide. Um, I, can, I, can, I can take the example of Wirecard recently in Germany. Um, lack of transparency and disclosure is an indicator of, of not necessarily a well-governed company. Yes, very, very interesting. Uh, your final uh, statement regarding uh, your expectation in that uh, area. What do you believe will be done in the future by using this new framework and direction in the corporate life? Well, again, yes. Um, the, the, yes, the, the recent development... The expectations, your ex expectations for the future regarding uh, this new environment. Yes, so the recent developments were necessary. Um, what, I mean, something else is that, I mean, we, we usually do not like, and not only um, investors, but also corporations, we, we do not like hard law. Um, but what, what we have noticed in many cases is that uh, soft law is not enough. And when uh, the compliance explain a model is, can work for some time, but at some point some enforcement is necessary. And so the, what, what the, the, the Greek legislator has done recently is very important, and I think it can bring uh, some trust in the market from, from, for, for, from, you know, for investors. Um, I'm, I'm thinking especially the, the recent law that was passed this summer that uh, finalized the implementation of the uh, SRD2. And this is uh, this represents, I think, a big step. And so we are quite confident uh, that, first of all, uh, practices will improve uh, because basically corporations will have no choice but to uh, be compliant with the law. But also, uh, in terms of, of, of disclosure, um, I think there is, there is a need for, for the, the Greek corporations to to step up. And, and to be in line with, with all the markets, um, because this, this, without without this this, uh, this confidence, uh, without this disclosure and transparency, um, some some investors may be just uh, not disregarding, but may be less tempted to 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 invest in in the Greek economy. Um, this, so this is more on the governance side on on the ENS, um, there's, there's, I mean, this is a wide debate, I guess. Sometimes, and again on disclosure, uh, sometimes the company is doing the right thing, but it's just not um, not, not not necessarily willing to, but not doing the the, the job in disclosing the right information. To invest. If you look at the, our ratings on, on, on Greek operations, um, we can clearly see that most of the time the, the issue is not the practice, but mainly, mainly the disclosure. And with that appropriate disclosure, we cannot figure out whether whether the the company is doing the, the right thing or not. But we are yes. overall are, we are pretty confident that uh, with the with the recent effort uh, at uh, legal level and also um, corporate level, um, trust we will come back. Yes, very 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 interesting uh, ideas and uh, propositions. Uh, if you would like to say. Just one word uh, for your final uh, statement. Uh, you are welcome. In order to pass uh, to the ladies, Leah and Maria, Pipo, say something at the end. Um, well, um, ESG is, is paramount. It's paramount for, for, for investment. Uh, it's paramount for investors. And corporations uh, should understand that it should be paramount as well for the for the operations, uh, for the image they give, uh, and to not only to investors but to to, to the world society. Um, it, it's it's not something that I mean, focusing on financial is of of course important, but ESG is is becoming I'm not saying as equal as financial, but is is becoming very important for. For investor community, so uh, communicating and being open on on this uh, matter um, can be 
are and will be beneficial for corporations. Yes, thank you, Thibault, for your participation. Let's take your last statement as a lighthouse that shows the direction and protects our route as well. Thank you for your participation. Thank you again. Sorry Let's for move. This. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to pass the floor uh, to, to Leah in order to say a few words about yourself, your company, and uh, a general statement to warm up uh, the, the audience for the ESG factors and the relation to the corporate uh, way of doing business. Leah, your floor is yours. Thank the floor you. is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, as uh, Pantelis says, my name is Leah Vigileu. I'm a corporate and commercial lawyer in Platis Anastasiadis and Associates Law Firm. Our law firm is part of the EY Law Global Network. We operate in more than 83 jurisdictions right now. Uh, we provide this to both domestic and international clients in all um, I'm heading the corporate and commercial. Uh, we provide advice on a wide spectrum of corporate law matters, including, of course, corporate governance and regulatory compliance. Um, I'm very happy and honored to be with you today and to participate in such a distinguished panel, especially on a subject which becomes increasingly relevant for businesses such as ESG factors and especially the, the governance uh, pillar of ESG. So, thank you. I'm not sure if you can... Pantelis, I can't hear you, but I'm hoping that you can hear me. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What, uh, Maria, what about you, your company? And uh, general... Yeah a statement about your view in these hot topics of now <laughs> yeah so my name is uh, maria larson artino i'm a global esg manager within the investment stewardship team at legal and general investment management we are a asset manager um, with approximately 1.5 trillion dollars under uh, assets uh, under management sorry uh, which uh, equates about to 1.3 trillion uh, euros. We are long-term investors in both equities and bonds. We have a long-standing uh, commitment to constructively raise corporate governance standards um, and sustainability standards both, uh, globally. And we work both with regulators and our investee holdings um, to raise these standards. And we are invested across uh, all sectors and, and all uh, markets. I'm, I was very pleased to hear what both uh, Ms. Cassani and Ms. Conti, and of course, my, uh, Thibault was saying uh, as well, which I think will resonate a lot with what I will be speaking about um, today. If, uh, Pantelis, are you okay if I just continue and make a, a general statement on, on ESG and what? Yes, the, just your general view about this thing. Perfect, perfect. So why should uh, Greek companies uh, concern themselves with ESG? Is it not just a thing nice to have on the, on the side? I think incorporating ESG standards in your company strategy is good, it's good, it's good business and is good business practice. It's not any longer a nice to have um, extra. It is a question um, of mat materiality. For us as investors, it's part of our risk assessment when we invest. ESG standards, whether we're looking at Greek companies or other companies, are moving up the agenda significantly for those people who decide on whether or not to invest um, in, in, in companies and those who are selling and buying shares. ESG funds are the biggest growth area within asset management. And ESG materiality assessments are applied across the board within asset management, so not just within ESG funds. And that applies both to active investors and large index investors as, 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 as we are. We will use ESG disclosures 
in, um, for example, tilting certain funds to allocate um, capital to those companies that score higher on their ESG um, disclosures and, and practices and standards. We as asset managers are also being pushed by regulators to take into ESG standards. And so similarly, our clients are both um, requested by, by regulators to increase their um, ESG disclosures and how they invest our, um, their money. And hence, they will also push us um, as asset managers to focus even further on ESG uh, materiality. I think it will be very interesting in a year's time to see which companies have survived better the pandemic. And I would be surprised if we don't find a very good number of well-run companies with good ESG credentials to having um, succeeded better than those companies who don't. Um, I would maybe end on just saying that the non-incorporation of good ESG practices, practices will for us and many other investors lead to voting uh, consequences, which I think is a bit what Thibault was, was talking about when, when he was presenting. Um, I'll, I'll stop there and, and uh, Pantelis, I'll let you uh, lead and see if, it, if you want me or, or Leah to continue. Yes, uh, I will say if you, I will uh, insist how important, how, if you can quantify this importance, how important is ESG factors for indexed fund asset managers? Do you have thank, any thank you indication, indication in order to say, uh, yes, generally speaking, it's important, but how important is? Mm. No, no, that, that, thank you for that. I think it, it, it covers several things. I think what one is, is again, as I said, our, our clients are asking for this. Um, I think the indication of what I mentioned before is the, the, the most significant inflow of funds for us are in ESG funds. And I think it is in, in, in our, the way we look at companies and evaluate companies will depend a lot on their ESG practices. So for example, we have developed an ESG score internally, which we're certainly not unique. I would say the majority of my colleagues in the investment industry will have done something um, similar. In this ESG uh, score, will um, we measure E, S, and N, G within that, within that score and, and, and have a point system, let's say, and, and that will result in certain companies on a very de minimis standard receiving higher or lower uh, scoring. That will affect A, our engagement process with the companies, and B, in those funds that we can um, tilt, that will have an implication, which means that for companies that has a capital allocation, um, either a favor or a negative impact on 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 the on the company. Um, so I think I think that's how material E S and G are for us as an, in investors, and it, it is part of our risk assessment process um, at the moment. And, and I will see even if I look past the last few years, working with my active teams, the significant amount of engagement that we have across our index team and our active teams on ESG issues has definitely uh, increased. Um, and they will come to us and ask uh, where they have concerns over ES and G practices. And that can also lead to a very direct investment or non-investment. And I've seen that specifically over this past year where um, investment hasn't been done due to ESG concerns and where investment post-engagement the fund manager felt comfortable in investing uh, in, in the company. Yes, Maria, very thorough coverage of this, uh, this issue. I would like to ask uh, Leah two words. Real benefit or burden for the companies, the ESG factors? 
Well, I believe, uh, as, as Maria also pointed out, that uh, more recently companies and investors have come to realize that these factors are not just uh, uh, good to have or a public relations marketing mm -hmm. trick, let alone a burden, but they have many benefits and re very real and practical effects. And they are becoming critical to long-term competitive success, I think. Um, first of all, they, they become more attractive to investors, as Maria explained. But on top of that, uh, there are also other very tangible benefits. Uh, companies which take a proactive approach to ESG policies usually minimize the regulatory and legal interventions. They lower the risks of incurring fines, penalties or enforcement actions. While they usually stand better chances in earning subsidies also, they, they increase their brand image, they enjoy usually higher retention rates, uh, and also seen from a different angle. Companies who fail to take into account these uh, risks, uh, they, they might incur reputational damage. Imagine a company facing inequality or gender discrimination accusation. This, definitely harms the brand, uh, the brand image. And uh, of course, these factors are also uh, not just useful, but very, very beneficial for, for investors as well. When they screen investments, they could um, identify companies whose practices uh, could pose a risk. So it's not just a matter of opportunity, it's a matter of risk as well. Mm -hmm. uh, recent Examples could be the scandals with regards to gas emissions or oil spills, which had a very tangible and direct effect on, on the share prices of the companies involved. So I think it's, it's now becoming very clear that ESG factors are critical to long-term competitive success and, mm -hmm. and they're not just uh, a, a marketing trick. To say so. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Leah, uh, I will uh, continue on that direction. The prerequisites regarding the environment, the legal framework especially, are in place in order to exploit all these benefits uh, uh, the, to be exploited by the companies and for the economy as a whole. Uh, say a few words about the prerequisites and the legal environment for the development of this new or things. Yes. Uh, so, ESG factors are, as also previous speakers uh, have explained, have to do with environmental, social, and corporate governance issues, all of which are uh, increasingly important. Um, however, lately there is a very vivid discussion uh, with regard to corporate governance, especially in Greece. Uh, as, as you are aware, uh, we currently, the, the law dates back to 2002, almost 18 years ago. Uh, so for many years, there was a need to modernize the corporate governance regime because a good corporate governance law has to be, among others, up to date to address new challenges. Um, so we were very happy to see that the, this July uh, a new law was introduced which um, aligned uh, the, the current law with the EU legislative framework. It incorporated relevant EU provisions and also it takes into account the international trends in this domain. Um, this is especially crucial for attracting investments uh, because uh, investors needs to know that uh, they are comfortable to invest. They need to have the comfort that they will do business in a familiar and transparent governance environment without incurring the risks, costs in getting to know or assessing a very particular or obscure uh, governance system. Um, yes. I think that uh, this new law um, really uh, addresses all these challenges. It, uh, it is quite detailed, has regulated issues of the board, its committees, provision of information to shareholders, and so on. Um, I won't bore you with too much details 
about uh, the relevant provisions. But I believe two points need to be highlighted exactly because they reflect this international standards we I was talking about before. Um, a novelty of the law is that for the first time it introduces a fitness and propriety policy for the election of the BOD members in a similar way like credit institutions. Uh, the company is obliged to uh, apply this policy and uh, publish it as well. And what is particularly interesting is that the law itself determines as uh, eligibility uh, criteria that the candidate must not be involved in risky transactions with related parties, as evidenced by court judgments. This is a very important step towards integrity. And uh, it also uh, demands that uh, both genders are sufficiently represented in the board. As a minimum percentage, it sets 25%. This is, again, a, a very important step towards gender equality in management bodies. Um, what is also worth noticing is that the law elevates the independent standards of the BOD members and the role as well. Uh, this uh, member is considered, among others, as independent if uh, his or her shareholding is lower than 0.5% in the company mm -hmm. and that uh, it does not have any dependence of any nature, business, financial or otherwise with the company. And yes. it's also Let's... important that the board annually, at least annually, should revisit and confirm the fulfillment of this, uh, this criteria. Uh, to so that to ensure real independence and not just story, uh, with regards to to a certain member. Um, and uh, there are also the nominations and remuneration committees, novelties of the law as well, independent committees. Uh, their majority again is comprised by independent non-executive BOD members. These committees may merge into one if the company so wishes. So it's clear that the framework introduced enhances transparency, independence, diversity, business ethics, all these pillars of good governance that are so essential to, to sustainable growth. Uh, yes. At the same time, I think it's, it's clear that uh, the companies need to work systematically to, to reach these standards and adopt, I would say, a holistic approach corporate governance and take into account legal, business and financial considerations which are working on building a good governance system. And um, just from my experience, for example, as part of EY and working together as a lawyer with business advisors, financial advisors and people's advisors, I've seen that all these different aspects and different sources of knowledge and viewpoints can, can create significant synergies and are indeed critical for a corporate governance policy to be at the same time compliant, of course, but also efficient, business-oriented, business-driven. So I think it, it's a golden opportunity for companies right now. The momentum is very important. If they, if they take this uh, seriously and they, they work on building a sustainable corporate governance system, I think it will be a huge advantage on yes. the way forward. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, uh, th thank you, thank you, Leah. Uh, Ma Maria, as you understand, all the factors are in place, the legal environment, the willingness uh, to invest in such uh, new things, and also uh, the attract what about the attractiveness apart from the financial data uh, well, of the Greek companies in order to get to gain more attention from the international fund managers? Well, what is your suggestion to an, to an yeah, international fund manager regarding the performance of the Greek companies apart from the financial data? the yeah. legal framework, the willingness and the alignment of uh, their behavior in the, to the international practices 
uh, and all the other f funny things. Tell us about. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Pantelis. That's a great. That's a great question. And I wanted to link back to what uh, Leah was 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 saying, and I think that's a, that's um, part of my answer to your question. I think I mean transparency for us is key. So the disclosure. If if a company doesn't uh, disclose about something, we won't know about it. So I think d disclosure is, is and transparency is absolutely key in that in that. Um, Within, within that field. What it, it feeds into as well um, is, is in our ESG score, for, for example, that I was mentioning before, and, and what Leah was saying, you know, the diversity of the board, our ESG score, one of the indicators that we look on is exactly diversity on the board, um, senior management, um, and, and employee base as, as general. So A, you disclose against that, and B, it feed your disclosure will feed into the score and has an impact on how we look at, the, at, at an initial look at the company and what we consider having de minimis standards being uh, being being applied. So th I think that is is very important. Something else that um, how does it impact us as an, as investors? How we look at things? How we look at at. Uh, at investments so um, i would give an example that that everybody knows so i'm not disclosing anything um that, that's not out for there so wirecard a, a, you know a, a huge audit scandal we had looked at the company already last year so n nothing yet in the not really in the papers bar from the from the ft of course and we, in our scoring system they had come out very poorly so when our fixed income team met with the company there were already lots of red flags and the way they responded to our requests made it evident for the fixed income team that they wouldn't be comfortable buying the bonds on, on the, sh the roadshow that the company was, was bringing. And I think that's a clear indication how you quickly you can see, now the buy card is an extreme example, but it, it already last year and the year before, it started to show up in our ESG scores that there was something that wasn't fully right. They weren't meeting the minimum standards and i think that is so important as a company to making sure that you are meeting those minimum standards that it, at least and preferably going um, beyond that i wanted to add in, in in into that as well what many companies will come to us and say what, what but what do you want really bar the minimum practices and we don't know and what we have taken a very conscious decision of publishing all our principles all our policies our esg score is published on our website our thought pieces are published on our website so it's it's useful for companies to look at their biggest shareholders and look at their esg requests on their website have they published what they're asking for and use that as a means of understanding better what we as investors are looking for but that it will be helpful to them to implement um, their own policies and improve perhaps at times their their uh, their ESG um, standards and and, and we, we're certainly not the only investors doing that so I think that can be um, be be very be very helpful in 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 doing that um, I think I might have gone a bit off track so if you want to direct me to another area that you would like me to discuss Pantelis uh, please do so yes. Uh... We are uh, we are at the final steps of this uh, yeah. panel, uh, uh, but uh, I would like to ask you, Maria, how your company is bridging the holdings during this uh, COVID nineteen demanding period. To say a few words yeah. about this. Uh, current situation, uh, what about your holdings and uh, make a statement about all this uh, very, let's say, demanding and delicate issues that should be yeah, yeah. handled. Tell, tell yeah. us. And after that, we'll, uh, you will make a general statement uh, about uh, all this uh, discussion and things, and we will finish mm. this panels. COVID-19 yeah. and your holdings. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Pantelis. So, what as Elgin, what we decided in the beginning, like like everybody else, uh, you know, it was uh, it was a shock to to our to our system. Even if some of our economists had started to view con had concerns in the beginning of the year, 
what we decided to do when the lockdown hit the UK, we decided that it um, was important for us to reach out to our MSD holdings and tell them that we were standing behind uh, them in this critical time and that we were standing behind them in the difficult decisions that they were taking, which I would say we focused in particular on two things. One was saying, we're, we're standing behind you. We understand that that might mean uh, delaying or completely canceling dividend policies. We are happy within citation marks for you to do that as long as you do it, um, taking into account all stakeholders, uh, which means you know your employees, the supply chain, your, your clients and, and, and customers, in the view of ensuring that you have a long-term sustainable uh, company. If that meant delaying or postponing dividends, we, would, we were supportive of them doing that. I think the second part was also saying, do not lower your ESG practices. Do not lower those uh, best practice standards that you've been upholding so far. Um, and I think those, that was very much what we were clear on. It was something we, we reached out directly to our um, MSD holdings and were open for conversations and, and dialogue uh, on that. We did emphasize at the same time that when it came to the AGM season, we would not be lowering our standards uh, in seeking um, when approving the, the, the resolution. So we wouldn't say, you know, well, this year it's fine if you do an oil spill or, uh, you know, um, fire all your employees um, or that your board now is is uh, can't operate and so if you have lots of non-independent directors we, we won't worry about those we upheld our 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 standards but at the same time emphasized that we are supportive in the decisions that you you uh, the difficult decisions they need to, to take as long as your whole you know making sure you're taking into account um all state uh, stakeholders um, we, the exception that we made was, uh, was for capital raising in emergency situations. If that was something um, that was needed, uh, even if it uh, passed by uh, our uh, maximum thresholds, we were willing to support the companies in, 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 that, kind of, uh, in that kind of way. So I think that's, that's how we saw, we saw ourselves as, as, as uh, partners and supporters of, of our investee holdings rather than being um, um, confrontational and realizing the extraordinary difficult situations they and consequently we were were in. Yes, um, you're right. Please. My violent emergence on the screen indicates that your time is up. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm the bad one. I'm the black. I'm the referee with the black clothes. You know, I'm about to blow the whistle. Uh, if there is a, a final remark, Pandeli, Elia, Maria, please do it, but yes, we are obliged just, to just, conclude. Just a, just a question. Yes. What about the market and companies' readiness to adopt and to exploit this new uh, promising environment? Elia? Uh, I think they are just ready to a significant degree. Uh, more ready than perhaps we expected. Uh, in July, we organized the corporate governance webcast. We had uh, we presented the new law, and we had almost 260 uh, company participation. We launched the poll during the session on the new areas of the law, and uh, the, the response the responses were were very encouraging. Uh, more than 51% consider that their companies are ready to a very high degree. Uh, to adopt the corporate governance policies of the new law. Uh, almost uh, eight out of 10 uh, believe that uh, corporate gover good corporate governance uh, contributes to long-term value for their companies. So they have acknowledged the importance of co corporate governance. And again, almost 80% uh, of the respondents uh, considered that the environment of independent BOD members in will increase the investors' trust and enhance the efficiency of the board operations. So I think it's fair to say, judging from, from the above, that companies have begun to realize the importance of corporate governance. And, uh, no longer approach it as just another obligation, but as a set of rules and procedures which can add value to the company, attract investment, and con contribute to, to their sustainable growth. 
And According to the answer of conclusion the conclusion is that the uh, government governance to... is not a marketing gimmick. It's a very complex mm -hmm. set of rules and procedures and very useful for the investors and the people working for the companies as well for the stakeholder. Uh, but at least, yes, you can have the last word. Yes, I don't, I don't yeah, think Yes, uh, Maria, are you convinced? No, no, to become you have no more questions. No, no, no. <laughs> the, the, the answer is yes, of course. The question is according <laughs> to the position and the statement of uh, Leah, are you convinced to become an evangelist of Greek companies to the European landscape? The answer is yes. Of course. Tell <laughs> of course, thank you, thank you, <laughs> thank you for your answer, thank you for your for the participation, thank you for the supervising by Christos Constas and uh, the organizing and the the inception of Constantinos Suzunis uh, and all the endeavors of the organizing team. Thank you for your participation. Thank you for the information. Thank you for the vivid discussion. No more thank yous, ladies, Padelis, everybody. It was a very uh, useful and very fruitful uh, discussion all morning from 10 to right now, 10, uh, 12, uh, 2, 2 15 already. Thank you for participating, and we have the results and the conclusions written and sent to you in a couple of days, I think. Bye bye. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending.